These are leaders of the nationwide youth organization that calls itself SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. It has more than 300 chapters on the college campuses of America. Its national and local leaders in convention here at the Chicago Coliseum, June 1969, take the major credit for the rioting, mob actions, takeovers, and burnings on college and university campuses throughout the nation. This has been finding out about the organization of SDS. We've always been quite willing to talk right, about We'll talk about socialism anywhere, in the streets or in the Senate, anywhere, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mike Klonsky. Uh, National Secretary of SDS, and this is Bernadine Dorn, Interorganizational Secretary. So you, you, you or is there a communist faction making a big power play for SDS? At this no. Is there any communist faction here? Yeah. I guess there is. Are there communists in this organization? Sure, okay. man. There's, there's a lot of communists. You'll see. When you come in and listen, you hear people talking, you, you can judge for yourself whether they're communists or not. There are communists in the organization, there's no doubt about that. Uh, there are also liberals in the organization. SDS is not, in the movement in this country, is not something that exists during the school year and is going to start up again in the fall. And if they have to worry about whether we're going to be in the streets in the fall, we're going to be on the streets and in every institution in this country from now on. What would you put? We're going to replace capitalism with socialism. This is the National Revolutionary Conference for a United Front Against So-Called Fascism bringing together students for a so-called democratic society, the Black Panthers, and other revolutionary student and working class youth at the Oakland, California Auditorium, July 18th through the 20th, 1969. The underlying purpose of the meeting was to further Lenin's emphasis on exploiting youth to advance communism. He said, youth will decide the entire struggle, both student youth and still more, the working class youth. The next voices expose the communist nature of the conference and are from top representatives of the Black Panthers, the Young Patriots, SDS, and the Communist Party USA who were featured on the program. The synchronized sound film was not obtainable for this program, but because what the revolutionaries are saying is so vitally important to America's security, we are presenting their taped voices which are properly identified later in the film. Representing the Black Panthers, we're going to fight some capitalism with some basic socialistic programs. We'll fight imperialism with proletarian internationalism. We need socialism in practice. We need an understanding of Marxist-Leninist principles so that we may put our knowledge into revolutionary practice. Representing the young patriots. And the gun on the side of the revolutionary, on the side of the people, means Solidarity and socialism. Representing the Black Panthers. The red book is my Bible, the gun is my staff. Representing SDS. Our program is going to be to come back on the campuses this fall and hit them harder than they've ever been hit before. The struggle that is going to ultimately defeat United States imperialism is going to be an international struggle. It's going to be an armed struggle. It's going to be a struggle that's going to have to take place in the third world against U.S. imperialism and in the mother country against U.S. imperialism. We must be clear on how the final struggle will be waged, and we must be a part of that struggle. Students, students must be opening up the campuses to the working class, must be going into the working class communities, becoming part of the proletariat, and must be getting ready for armed struggle. Representing the Communist Party, USA. We want a redirection of U.S. foreign policy from one which seeks to destroy the national liberation struggles of the peoples and to contain and roll back socialism, an end to U.S. militarism, the disbanding of all overseas U.S. bases, an end to the draft, the return of U.S. soldiers from abroad, and in the first place, the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam. A U.S. foreign policy that boycotts and blockades South Africa and supports and trades with and encourages the Revolutionary Republic of Cuba. Yes, they are communists. Their mission proudly proclaimed the violent overthrow of the democratic system. And yet our nation seems unbelieving, even unconcerned. 
Many newspapers, television commentators, and educators call these young revolutionaries dissidents. The problem, they say, is simply one of student unrest. But are these voices voices of mere dissent, of mere student unrest, or of sedition and revolution? I am Walter H. Judd. This film is presented by the National Education Program, Searcy, Arkansas, to inform and to impress upon American citizens who love their country the true nature and the true magnitude of those forces linked to world communism that are working within our nation for its overthrow. We do not challenge freedom of dissent on college campuses or anywhere in America. We acknowledge the existence in colleges and universities of broad areas for improvement and we support efforts toward changes beneficially affecting the future of American youth. This documentary is devoted to an entirely unrelated movement for change, a movement of revolution, which openly declares its purpose to be first the destruction of our American educational system, then our economic system, and finally our system of government. Let the revolutionaries themselves tell it like it is in this film, Communists on Campus. This is Mark Rudd, June 1969, elected national leader of SDS at this national SDS convention at the Chicago Coliseum. This is Mark Rudd, April 1968, at Columbia University, New York City. Rudd had been named chairman of the SDS chapter at Columbia after returning from a three-week tour of Cuba where he visited Fidel Castro. Um, we, we have closed down four university buildings, three of which have un usually have classes. Um, we've had mass meetings of 800 and 600 people respectively. What do you Many think will be the outcome of this? Do you think that uh, you'll get all those six demands? Isn't anything negotiable here? What will be the outcome? Um, we think that, that we will win our demands. We think we're in, a, we're in a very strong position. In fact, we think this is probably, uh, well, very strong position. Uh, we think we will win our demands. When do you people think the, who had been sympathetic to you now say they're annoyed because you've gone too far? I would say that, that we now have more support than any group has on, about any political issue has ever held on any, at any time. We have the McCarthy group, the, uh, which has 650 members, is behind us. The, the Certainly there are people from off campus. This is a number of our demands, our substantive demands about the gym, involve community issues and our demands about the Institute for Defense Analysis invo analyses involves um, involves issues worldwide issues and, and the question of, of support for Americans po for the United States policy, foreign policy SDS leader Mark Rudd later admitted his demands at Columbia were a hoax and a pretext quoting the National Review November 5 1968 let me tell you Rudd said we manufactured the issues the Institute of Defense Analysis is nothing at Columbia, just three professors. And the gym issue is bull. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. Is SDS, Mark, really interested in Columbia, or is it just a stepping stone? Uh, are you concerned with something much bigger than Columbia? Why did you use Columbia, or did you use Columbia? I say that, that neither is true, or both are true. So what it is is a, a, uh, a training ground, or, or not only a training ground, but one, one that has immediate relevance. The Columbia University confrontation, according to its SDS leader, Mark Rudd, was a training exercise, and the goal, the takeover by violence of the United States. According to a Los Angeles Times report, December 22, 1968, and I quote, at the height of the student rebellion at Columbia, an SDS leader was approached by worried moderates who objected to reported plans for using clubs and gasoline against the police. They were told very clearly, quote, you liberals don't understand what the scene is all about. 
It is about power and disruption. The more blood, the better. End of quote. SBS leader Mark Rudd wrote Grayson Kirk, the then president of Columbia University, quote, you call for order and respect for authority. We call for socialism. Rudd's SDS group and Rap Brown's student Afro-American society paralyzed the university. Brown, one of the leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, has agitated all over America. The black students of Columbia University, joined by a few members of the black community, have been in Hamilton Hall for 56 hours, more than that now. Now the brothers in here maintain that they will stay here until the university is willing to talk on their terms. And we are going in the community of Harlem and bolster the support down there. So we're going to let Columbia know that if they don't want to deal with the brothers in here, they're going to deal with the brothers on the street. <laughs> April 20th, 1969. It was Parents Week at Cornell. Often many parents stay at Straight Hall in the heart of the campus. Some had already moved in and got evicted when black students decided to occupy the hall. The blacks were demanding the usual things, black studies, amnesty, and such. Their demands were met and they came out. It was then everyone realized the black students were armed during the occupation. They carried at least 17 rifles and guns when they left the hall. Campus police didn't try to take the guns away from them. They were allowed to keep them in their dormitories. It is still not quite clear who won at Cornell, but the black students and the tactics of armed occupation did not lose. We return to the Oakland Revolutionary Conference. We hear the chairman and co-founder of the Black Panther Party and one of the organizers of the United Front Against Fascism, Bobby Seale, who was also a defendant in the Chicago conspiracy trial until given a jail sentence for persistent disorderly conduct in the courtroom. And we are going to create, and we're going to put together the very near, near future, an American Liberation Front. Bobby Seale wants to set up an American Liberation Front to parallel, for example, the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, the Hanoi-sponsored Viet Cong. With the communist North Vietnamese, they have thus far murdered or maimed hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese civilians and over 300,000 American soldiers trying to help keep Southeast Asia from communist subjugation. Mass graves have been found and uncovered near Hue, South Vietnam, disclosing over 2,000 bodies, most of them in civilian clothing. Many of the victims were bound and executed, while some were undeniably buried alive. South Vietnamese who managed to escape the atrocities said the victims, who were mostly teachers, policemen, minor government officials, farmers, and some soldiers, were made to dig their own graves. The Black Panther Party, we've been accused of, is being led by the American Communist Party. We've been accused of that quite a bit. Bobby Seale didn't reply to the accusation that the Black Panther Party is a part of the world communist apparatus. But his Minister of Information, Eldridge Cleaver, a top voice of the Black Panthers, speaking from communist-dominated Algiers to which he had fled, set the record straight, and I quote, we are a Marxist-Leninist party, and implicit in Marxism-Leninism is proletarian internationalism. David Hilliard, Panther Chief of Staff, added, quote, Marxism, Leninism, and Socialism must be the goal of the revolutionaries who seek to destroy the American system. There were many top communists featured on the program with Panther Chairman Bobby Seale. One of them was this next speaker, the leading theoretician and strategist of the Communist Party USA, Herbert Aptheker. I deeply appreciate the honor of speaking here this evening. For me, the honor is multiplied since J. Edgar Hoover has denounced this meeting's main initiator, the Black Panther Party, as quoting, without question, the greatest threat to the internal security of the country.
If J. Edgar Hoover condemns something, it must be good. And if J. Edgar Hoover condemns something in terms of great severity, then it must be very good indeed. To be attacked by the chief cop of America is a magnificent tribute. May the Black Panther Party in the future continue to merit the diatribes issuing from his foul mouth. This is the daughter of Herbert Aptheker, self-admitted communist Bettina Aptheker. At the University of California at Berkeley in the fall of 1964, with Mario Savio, shown here, Bettina organized and was one of the leaders of the so-called free speech movement, the beginning of the disruption successes for the communists on American campuses. She is quoted as saying, she has it in mind to spearhead a student revolution, which will hopefully lead to what she calls the erosion of the democratic form of government and eventual establishment of Kremlin-like leadership in the United States. She has herself boasted, and I quote, we will, if necessary, take over the college campuses in this country if our demands are not met. The free speech movement leaders were flown to other major university campuses on a well-planned and well-financed speaking tour. Here, at their arrival in New York City, they were met by the press. Yeah, the, uh, the tour was arranged, uh, uh, the speaking part of it at colleges, by Students for a Democratic Society. Do you see this as an issue that will be affecting other campuses, or is this a specific problem in your own school? No, I think that this will, uh, in the near future, begin affecting other campuses. Gus Hall, leader of the Communist Party USA, emphatically declared, and I quote, we've got the W.E.B. Du Bois clubs, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the SDS going for us. Today, he could include the Black Panther Party and a dozen or so others. On December 28, 1966, at the University of Chicago, this student peace program committee, made up of student and faculty leftists, met in answer to an appeal sent out by communist Bettina Aptheker for a nationwide student faculty strike. The House Committee on Un-American Activities reported, and I quote, the proposal for the nationwide student strike was completely communist in origin. The aim of the dominant communist element in these movements is to undermine the United States, promote a communist takeover in Vietnam, and the general advance of world communism." Unquote. The group with the largest representation at this conference was SDS. One of the principal speakers of the conference, the initiator of the idea for a nationwide student faculty strike, and the author of this book, Big Business and the American University, was Bettina Aftheker. Are the communists running this conference? <clears throat> There's a temporary steering committee, uh, which consists of 15 organizations plus four people from the preparations committee. The organizations include SDS, the National Student Association, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, the Young Socialist Alliance, the Du Bois Club, uh, the Chicago Peace Council, who are the hosts of this conference, and so forth. What kind of decisions do you expect to see out of this conference? Well, I don't want to preclude anything that the conference is going to decide. Uh, I don't want to make a statement that uh, uh, then sort of binds people to it. But I would say that uh, the purpose of the conference is to discuss the possibilities of a nationally coordinated student mobilization in the spring against the war. And in particular on the issues of the draft, on the issue of university participation in the war effort, for example, war research, CIA uh, research, and so forth that are done on campuses. And uh, that's the purpose of the conference, and one would hope, although it's not uh, certain, I mean, we're going to discuss it, some form and some, some kind of nationally coordinated protest. You just heard communist Bettina Aptheker dictate the issues in 1966, which to this day are being used by the communists to rally often on campus dissidents, militants, and dupes to accelerate their drive for the violent overthrow of our country. We have a message from Eldridge Cleaver to all the people in the United Front Against Fascism. And the message is this, right on. This is Eldridge Cleaver, convicted felon, a fugitive from the California penitentiary. He is one of the top leaders of the Black Panther Party, idol and hero of the revolutionary New Left. Here in the pages of the Black Panther Party newspaper, 
Eldridge Cleaver speaks out to his comrades in the U.S. a message from his hideout in communist Cuba at another time. He emphasizes the importance of destruction on the college campus. He writes, and I quote, the most sensational and explosive clashes are being centered and focused more and more on the college campuses and on high school campuses. We must destroy their institutions from which they derive their power. We have to destroy the present structure of power in the United States. We have to overthrow the government, and the only means possible is violent overthrow. This is the voice of the Black Panthers repeating the Communist Party line, giving the words to the actions of today's stormtroopers. Another old guard communist was in the spotlight again, Archie Brown, one of the agitators who led the student riots against the House Committee investigating communist activities in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1960, the first major exercise of the misuse of student power by the communists in the 60s. This working class United States is going to organize and fight in its majority and is going to win and is going to lead the way to take over the government and make it a government for the workers and for the people. It's even more so because the emphasis is on the working people who are going to make the change together with everybody else when the change is going to be made. One of the propositions was that anybody who was a communist, which I was and am, I think we can help win the working class and their unions to a program to defeat fascism and for progress and socialism in this country. Thank you. You have just heard admitted communist Archie Brown calling for progress and socialism in this country. What he really is calling for is regressive and repressive totalitarianism as practiced by communism wherever in power in the world today. The next speaker, the new interorganizational secretary of SDS, Jeff Jones, announces SDS policy. It's the feeling of SDS, the fight that's being waged on the campuses, when it's waged solely on the campuses, is a fight that can end up only on the campuses. That's not where we're at at all. That's not where we as an organization of young revolutionaries are trying to move the student movement, are trying to link it up with the working class movement as the primary key upon which we're trying to build our movement. Organizations like the Black Panther Party, are the other revolutionary, international proletarian revolutionary organizations in this country. We're starting off on October 11th in Chicago. Last year, our most militant confrontation with the big power structure around the war at the time of the Democratic Convention. Now there's eight revolutionaries on trial for organizing that demonstration. They're trying to stifle us, they're trying to repress us, they're trying to slow us down. We say that's bull We say that's bull That's the time for us to go back, even harder, stronger than we, were, than we were last summer. October 11th, give everybody a chance who's doing organizing this summer, trying to reach working class young people, to get them to come in Chicago and fight in an international struggle, to get them to pull students off the campuses the second and third week of the semester around demands like free all political prisoners, U.S. occupation troops out of Vietnam, the black and brown communities and off the schools. We must wage those demands, continue to wage those demands in the tradition of the San Francisco state struggle. More trouble erupted at San Francisco State College as the result of suspension of a teacher, George Mason Murray, a member of the Black Panthers. This is a film clip from Cuban national television. You see here George Mason Murray, the translation reads, and I quote, we believe that guerrilla warfare is the correct form of struggle for the North American Negro population. We say people who have been oppressed and colonized by imperialism and fascism have the right to get into those institutions and by doing that are going to change the class nature of those institutions and are eventually going to lead to shutting down those institutions until we've destroyed capitalism. I present to you tonight women combating fascism. Now we didn't put them up here for nothing. Here they are. 
and I introduce you to Marie Walker Johnson. Heretofore, women had been thought of as merely being content to remain in a prone position. Well, things ain't what they used to be. Sisters and brothers, the people who will be speaking on this panel has not been chosen because of their revolutionary rhetorics. They were chosen because of their correct practice. She's armed with correct theory and practice. None other than our own sister, Roberta Alexander. Dewey P. Newton says that we have to limit our bickering as much as possible between the movement and make our concentration upon the enemy. This is correct. Our sisters are struggling and participating in our political education classes. Our sisters are more and more taking a leadership role. We have sisters who can shoot. They can shoot as well as brothers. They're not sitting home with the babies. They're out there. They got their babies with them. They're out there in the community, out there doing field work. And it even goes down to the sexual levels. You know, whether or not the women are supposed to do so and so for the cause of the revolution, et cetera. And the Sisters of the Black Panther Party, and I hope the Sisters of the rest of the movement, of the rest of the United Front Against Fascism, follow the example of the Vietnamese women. All power to the people. Power to the people. The revolutionaries cry, all power to the people. The people want, the people will take. But the people they refer to are themselves, the conspiracy, the revolutionaries, the tiniest minority in our country. Seated next to Sister Roberta is not of a beautiful sister. Her name, Sister Carol Henry. The lines of demarcation have been clearly drawn between the pig oppressor and the people. These are Negro children participating in the free breakfast program sponsored by the Black Panther Party. These are some of the pages from the notorious Black Panther coloring book, which was handed out to children attending a free breakfast program in a church in San Francisco. This coloring book was dramatically exposed by the U.S. Senate's McClellan Investigating Committee. The coloring book teaches young Negroes to hate and kill policemen and incites them toward violence and murder. And as Comrade Mao Chesung says, fear no sacrifice. Surmount every difficulty and win, win to victory. I must remind you that there cannot be a successful struggle against fascism unless the broad masses of women are drawn into it. Down with the pig, fascist pig oppressor. Long live the people's liberation and struggle. Long live Huey P. Newton and Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All power to the people. All power to the people. Right on. Dictionaries tell us that communism and fascism, both totalitarian systems, have an officially prescribed, all-embracing ideology which has an answer for everything, a correct attitude toward every aspect of human existence. The ideology, the Bible of the Black Panthers and most of the New Left revolutionaries, is that prescribed in their ever-present little red book entitled Quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong. I'd like to introduce to you Sister Aura Williams. Chairman Mao says that a revolutionary should have largeness of mind, and he should be staunch and active, looking upon the interests of the revolution as his very life, and subordinating his personal interests to those of the revolution, always and everywhere. He should adhere to principle and wage a tireless struggle against all incorrect ideas and actions. He should be more concerned about the party and the masses than about any individual, be it mother, wife, or child, and more concerned 
about others than himself. Only then can he be considered a true revolutionary. You have a five-week-old daughter, Kiana Malik, who has been instilled with revolutionary principles. This was inborn in her from revolutionary parents through practice in a revolutionary environment. She was born a revolutionary and will die one, the first of a new generation whose minds will not be conditioned by this power structure. Victory to the people, victory is ours. All power to the people, and long live the Minister of Defense. Sister Merlene Dixon, Doctor of Sociology, UCLA. The Radical Women's Liberation Movement was created by an international revolutionary movement and is part of it. As a very great woman, assassinated by the German government as a dangerous revolutionary, Rosa Luxemburg, <laughs> once said, the history of revolutionary struggle is a history of failure, but you only need to win once, and we shall. All power to the people. We have a telegram that I'd like to read to you. It's from the Tokyo Communist League. It's dated July 19, 1969. Communist League sends strong solidarity on behalf of Japanese militants, revolutionary workers, and students. We must together establish our proletarian dictatorship to combat and destroy fascism, imperialism. Our struggle should be a violent one to resist and destroy the violence of establishment power. We proletariat, the brown nations, must form a practical link with the struggle for liberation in the third world, eventually to win in the struggle for world revolution. Our next speaker is Field Marshal from the Black Panther Party. Field Marshal Don Cox. Huey P. Newton says, the racist dog police must withdraw from the black community or face the wrath of the armed people. The Black Panther Party has a motto. It is a quote by Chairman Mao Zedong of the Chinese Communist Party. We are the advocates of the abolition of war. We do not want war, but war can only be abolished through war. In order to get rid of the gun, it is necessary to pick up the gun. Power to the people. Right on. All, of, all the Panthers know where political power comes from. <laughs> The Black Panthers and other revolutionaries refer to members of the National Lawyers Guild as revolutionary lawyers. William Kunstler, shown here, is a member of the National Lawyers Guild reported by the House Committee on Un-American Activities to be made up of Communist Front lawyers. Kunstler was one of the attorneys for the Chicago Eight, charged with conspiring to incite riots in Chicago during the 1968 Democratic National Convention. He was also defending the New York 21, a group of Black Panthers indicted on charges of conspiring to blow up a number of public buildings. Let us now listen to Attorney Kunstler as he seems to be inciting the black community to revolutionary violence. If you will remember, during the Newark rebellions, in Plainfield, New Jersey, some 40 Garand M1 rifles were found missing from the armory. The governor of New Jersey, Richard Hughes, ordered the police to search every home in the central wards of Plainfield, the black ghetto of Plainfield, to find those missing Garand rifles. I'm happy to say that not a single gun was found. There has not been a white policeman 
in the central wards of Plainfield since July of 1967. Now the other episode in Plainfield, which made it certain that this would be so, occurred some weeks after the theft of the guns. One white policeman by the name of John Gleason moved into the central wards of Plainfield on a Saturday afternoon. He marched down a street leading under a railroad underpass and then he shot a black man by the name of Bobby Lee Williams through the stomach. Bobby Lee Williams fell to the ground at this intersection near the railroad underpass. Gleason began to retreat out of the ghetto. He was followed by a crowd of black men and women and a block and a half past the intersection. He was stomped to death. In my opinion, he deserved that death. You must stand ready to defend yourselves. And if you are ready, I hope that you won't have to. But don't shrink if you have to. It is almost worse to be ready and able to defend yourselves and to freeze on the trigger when the time comes. Because then, you will have told the power structure that they need not fear you. The Black Panther Party, as you all know, is named the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Power to the people. You know, we always say, it's a very old saying that to all people that the best defense is a good offense. That's why we dropped that for self-defense a long time ago so that there's no need for it in the name of the Black Panther Party. You just heard Ray Masai Hewitt, the Black Panther Minister of Education, directly contradict Attorney Kunstler's use of the words for self-defense in the name the Black Panthers give themselves. According to the Plainfield, New Jersey Police Department, all the statements lawyer Kunstler made were false. The incident detailed by Kunstler happened on a Sunday afternoon, July 16, 1967, not Saturday afternoon, as Kunstler stated. The rifles referred to by Kunstler were not taken from an armory, nor were they Garand M1 rifles. The rifles, 30 caliber carbines, were stolen from a manufacturing plant near Plainfield. The governor of New Jersey did not order the police to search for the guns. Contrary to what Kunstler would have you believe, some of the guns were found. Routine patrols, which include white policemen, have continued to operate in all the wards of Plainfield, the shooting incident notwithstanding. And it occurred during the rioting on the same day as the theft of the guns, not weeks later, as Kunstler said. When Kunstler made his statement at the Revolutionary Conference, there was no legal proof that Officer John Gleason shot Bobby Lee Williams. Two of the 12 blacks indicted for the murder of Officer Gleason were found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. In an effort to create a stronger bond between students and workers, a panel of rank-and-file trade union activists were featured on the Revolutionary Conference program. The next speaker will be Noel Ignaton, who is an international harvester worker, member of UAW of Chicago. Noel. It's our opinion, opinion of myself and those of us in the shop, that it is no more possible to bring in a militant rank-and-file leadership into one of these unions by peaceful legal means than it is possible to seize state power by peaceful legal means. Brother Kenny Harston, who is the director of the Black Panther Caucus at UAW, Tremont, California. And he's also a very active brother, 
Black Panther Party. Kenny Hart. What I want to say at this time is that uh, the life and death struggle with reformism will begin. It has begun. How this struggle will end will depend on how completely the masses shake free of the present reformist leadership and put up militant resistance. Fascism will be our punishment tomorrow if we let pass the hour of socialism. Thank you. Clearly, no reform or progress within the American system is sought. The goal is total socialism, communism. The next speaker will be um, Bob Avakin from the Revolutionary Workers' Union in Richmond, California. Vietnam is the spearhead and the proof of that, that imperialism is being driven into a corner, that it's on the defensive, that it's on the decline, it's on the way out. And we have to understand that the proletariat, proletarian forces like the Black Panther Party already are taking the lead in forging a united front which will not only beat back fascism but can actually overthrow the imperialist system. Now SDS and other forces that we work with is proposing for this fall a fall action around the war in Vietnam to revive the, the, the uh, united front against the imperialist war in Vietnam and to force the imperialists out. And one of the key components of that must be working class organization and actions against the war in Vietnam. We've got to ask Archie to get those brothers on the long shore to stop scabbing on the Vietnamese people and stop loading that Have you ever asked yourself why we have had increasing trouble with discipline in our armed forces? Listen closely to the chairman of the American Servicemen's Union and you will understand. Okay, I'm gonna run down some stuff tonight about the GI revolts and rebellions that have been going on in the U.S. Army over the last year, the organizing drive that we're undertaking. But before I do that, I got something real important here. Korean people have asked the American Servicemen's Union to send their greetings to the revolutionary young people in America. And they sent us a letter, which I'm going to read. Dear Andy, our thinking is that the ASU and the People's Korea will combine efforts in chopping the head off U.S. imperialism. Will combine efforts in chopping the head off U.S. imperialism and tearing its limbs in concert with the revolutionary people the world over, in mutilating the U.S. ruling circles, fully supporting the ASU. You will readily agree with us in this respect, I believe. It's right on. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea is the banner of freedom and independence of our people, and also a powerful weapon of building socialism and communism. Your contributions will greatly encourage the Korean people in their struggle to achieve an independent, peaceful unification of the fatherland, accomplishing the complete victory of socialism and communism. The ASU is playing a leading role in this fight, in this organizing drive. We have chapters of the American Servicemen's Union on 60 large military installations in the United States and 40 overseas. Just as the Bolshevik party organized through the Soviets in 1917 against the Tsar and the oppression in Russia, the American Servicemen's Union is organizing Soviets within the U.S. Imperialist Army. The only line that's going to lead to victory, the only line that's going to lead to victory and revolution is a proletarian line in the army. And they know that whoever can command the allegiance of the rank and file troops, that command is going to be decisive in revolution or counter-revolution. And right now, the American Servicemen's Union is building an army within an army, a workers' militia inside the U.S. Army. And along with the Panthers and others, we're going to make that revolution. Power of the people. We are going to wind this session up tonight 
with national committees, plural, to combat fascism. Many wants to talk about how can we create the new party, the new mass people's party, the new workers' party, what have you, or however you want to phrase it, I think you should phrase it. Yes, we should create a party. The Black Panther Party says yes. You damn right we need to parallel an American liberation front in America. We say that needs to be done. And we're saying that we have some guns to deal with fascism, but let's start with the community control of police. If you don't want to deal with the guns, let's start dealing with the community control of police. Petition, let's move it. Let's defend the political prisoners. Power to the people. On September 5th, 1969, Angela Davis, after being hired as a philosophy professor at UCLA, first admitted she was a member of the Communist Party USA. Now, I think that the real reason that they're firing me is not only because of my membership in the Communist Party, but because I have tried to involve myself as much as I could in the black liberation struggle in this country. I worked with SNCC, with the Black Panthers, and with the BSU when I was a student down in uh, UCSC, the university campus at San Diego. I think we have enough trouble on campuses. Uh, the, the woman is an admitted member of the Communist Party. She also, in her letter to Chancellor Young, uh, indicated that she felt that the only way we could bring about the social change that's necessary today is through violence and militancy. I don't think we need that on campus. The vice chairman of the Black Students Union of UCLA admitted, and I quote, Many black leaders to whom black people look as symbols have been connected directly or indirectly with the Communist Party. The UCLA figure most instrumental in hiring Miss Davis last spring was Professor Donald Kalish, chairman of UCLA's philosophy department. Kalish, since 1965, has been extremely active in the anti-Vietnam War movement, anti-police activities, and a variety of other causes agitated by the Communists. Professor Kalish has boldly declared... Many of the young people I work with regularly belong to this branch of the Communist Party, that branch of the Communist Party, to progressive labor, which is probably far to the left of the Communist Party. I'm far to the left of the Communist Party. What kind of civilization is being offered by communists and other leftists? Would it be better than that which we now have? This is a vitally important question. Millions of American youth are being courted and beckoned agitated and incited to take violent actions against the American system, to throw it all overboard. But for what? What is to be the replacement? The best the revolutionaries can point to are the China of Mao Zedong, the North Vietnam of Ho Chi Minh, the Cuba of Fidel Castro, the Soviet Union of Lenin. What have these totalitarian dictatorships brought to their people? Have they brought the promised democratic freedom and the economic paradise for the workers? They have not. Instead, they have established dictatorships over the proletariat, the working people, rather than of the proletariat. And in the highest developed communist country, the Soviet Union, living standards are still about one-fourth of the American standard. The new left revolutionaries have accused you, the people of the United States, of being fascist. By dictionary definition, fascists subscribe to a highly centralized system of government which exercises absolute control over its people, imposing strict censorship and suppressing all opposition. Is this a picture of the United States or of Red China, North Vietnam, Cuba, and the Soviet Union and its satellites? The fascists we have to fear and unite against are SDS, Black Panthers, and all communists who demand a totalitarian system. You see, there is very little difference between communism and fascism. They are both totalitarian systems which share an officially prescribed, all-embracing ideology which has a supposed answer for everything, a correct attitude toward every aspect of human existence. The people who will be speaking on this panel, they were chosen because of their correct practice. She's armed with correct theory and practice. The Red Book is my Bible, the gun is my staff. Chairman Mao says he should adhere to principles and wage a tireless struggle against all incorrect ideas and actions. 
And as Comrade Mao Tsung says, the Black Panther Party has a motto. It is a quote by Chairman Mao Tsung of the Chinese Communist Party. Continually, the communists falsely accuse the United States of imperialism. The truth is that since 1939, communist imperialism has put under its rule nearly a billion people and about a third of the world's land area. A basic Leninist concept for the victory of communism aims at world conquest, nothing less. Through propaganda, infiltration and subversion, revolution, civil strife, and outright aggressive warfare. The young revolutionaries want to destroy our educational system, but they don't tell us that in communist countries, the state dictates and directs the education of its youth according to what it believes are the needs of the state. There is no such thing as special privilege for the education of minority groups, and many black students brought to the Soviet Union from Africa have quit and returned to their homes in disgust because of the discrimination practiced against them. At this 15th Congress of the Young Communist League of the Soviet Union, held in the Moscow Kremlin, Leonid Brezhnev compliments the young people who are now, he says, and I quote, putting their heart and soul into the work of implementing the decisions of the Communist Party's 23rd Congress, unquote. They are being congratulated for implementing the decisions of the communist dictatorship. The aim of communist education is not the mind free of ignorance and prejudice, but the state-directed conformist who does exactly what he's told. The purpose of communist education is the all-powerful state, whereas the goal of democratic education is the free man. And who is the state in communist countries? About a dozen communists in a self-appointed hierarchy. In Red China, the state is Mao Zedong. In North Vietnam, the state was Ho Chi Minh. In Cuba, the state is Fidel Castro all total dictatorships over the people. No person who is truly dedicated to freedom, liberty, and the concept of democratic government, who opposes tyranny and totalitarianism, and at the same time is truly informed about the nature and the record of communism, joins in communist-led or communist front operations. No group should be allowed to plunder, riot, and terrorize our educational institutions and impose its will upon a majority of students who go to college to study and learn. Will it take a national disaster of monumental proportions before the public wakes up to the enemy within, now operating with impunity? Must a free society allow itself to be destroyed because of the very freedoms it defends? For the students of this land, and for all of us, Understanding and finding ways to expose, neutralize, and overcome the communist threat is not a political issue. It is a matter of national survival.